I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, we need to walk as children of light. We need to be imitators of God, beloved children. We need to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And we find all of that in God's word. We need to look carefully how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of our time for the days are evil. Ladies, welcome to a very special 10-episode series with me, Jillian. Hello, ladies, and welcome back to this special 10-episode series about living out the Word of God. This is episode two, all about purpose. And I have been a little bit like nervous to record this one because I know it is going to step on some toes. And I know that not every Christian woman or even man agrees with what I am going to be saying. But as always, we have to use God's word as the standard, not our culture, not society, not our feelings, not our experience not tradition. We have to go to God's word and wrestle with it. We need to make sure we're doing um, our due diligence to make sure we're interpreting the scripture correctly. And so I, you know, I pray that the Lord will convict me if I am wrong in what I teach you ladies, but I, I haven't felt that. (laughs) I haven't felt that conviction. I do think that this is a proper exegesis of the scriptures, but again, please take everything that I say and hold it up to the word of God and um, take it before the Lord, take it before Christ. I know that this is going to be a hard one for some to swallow. I say that because I know personally a lot of women who don't agree with me on what true purpose is. I have a lot of talented women in my life who believe that they've been given these specific talents and that is their purpose, that that is their calling. And I disagree wholeheartedly. And we're going to talk about what do I believe a Christian woman's purpose is. Um, we're going to pray before we jump in and I will... I will do my best with the Holy Spirit's help to properly discuss this very important topic. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to reach women who I don't know personally, um, all over the country, all over the world even. I thank you for our sisters who take time out of their busy schedules to grow and learn and mature in your word. Thank you for for them. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for sanctifying us. Um, Thank you for your work within us, Father. We don't deserve it. It's all for your glory and for our good. I pray that you would help me uh, properly um, and rightfully teach your text, your word. It is sharp. It is alive. And I pray it will cut to the heart. It will convict any sin that may not even be aware to the to the person who is uh, committing it, Father. We love you, Lord, and I also pray that this is encouraging and edifying. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, ladies. Okay, so our main text is going to be Ephesians 2, but we are going to be going through different uh, scriptures. So you're going to hear me flipping. If you don't know, I do not edit my podcast. They are literally just straight through. So um, sometimes I laugh, sometimes I sneeze. I've even had a very unladylike burp because <laughs> I had drank a soda before I recorded. Whatever it is, I just know that uh, 
this is just real. It's like we're sitting together for a meal or over coffee and we are discussing this. And I really do feel like it's a two-way conversation, even though it's just me speaking to you. I love when you guys give me feedback and you talk to me and you email me. Thank you. Thank you for that. I truly love it and appreciate it. So yes, yeah, so you're going to be hearing flipping pages. Flip around with me. I hope you have your Bible. Or if you're taking notes, definitely write the notes down of the scripture references so that you can look them up yourself. All right, so purpose. Oh, like I said in the beginning, uh, there's a lot of, there's like, it's almost like it's two ways. So we don't want to be legalistic about our purpose. We don't want to be legalistic about our calling as Christian women. However, we want to make sure that we are actually following the will of God. And we're going to talk about what the Bible clearly states is his will. And I know that that, that's a question a lot of us ask. What is, see, there was a hiccup. See how unladylike I can be sometimes? (laughs) Um, I see a a professional would have edited that out, but I just want, I'll just keep it real. (laughs) Um, What was I saying? Oh yeah. So, um, a lot there's there's so there seems to be sides like there are some women who I I know personally very personally who and I love and I love and if they're listening you know I love you um that believe yes God has given me this talent for writing or maybe it's singing or for I don't know uh you know being a professional speaker and they believe that that is what they have been purposed set upon this earth to do. And then there's this other side, it seems, which is the side, I hate to even say sides because it sounds so disunifying, if that's even a word, which I don't want to do. I'm just trying to, to paint a clear picture of why this may step on some toes. So then there's this other side, which I would be on that, uh, believes that no, we're not put on this earth even for our talents, those are used. We can use those to glorify God. That is good. We shouldn't hide our talents. There's definitely, definitely room to preach on that. Like we need to be using what God has given us for his glory. But is that your highest calling? Is that your purpose? I say no. And so we're going to go through the, through scripture to talk and I will definitely defend that stance using God's word. Um, and so let's let's jump into it. So Ephesians 2 is where we're going to be um, mainly. And let's start in verse 9. Eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right, I'm going to read that one more time. For grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right, I'm going to read you two quotes that I just love. One is from Pastor Pastor Anthony Wood. He said, he saved us for good works, not because of our good works. And ooh, that will slay. I love that. And Yes, this this passage, Ephesians is one of my favorite books in the Bibles. I love it. I think I talked about it last episode about the epistles. I love them, love them, love them. This, these verses just knock away religion because religion is so much about what you do for God, right? What tradition, man-made, you know, laws and, and principles and standards and, and with Christianity, it's what Christ did. We are saved by works, but they're not our works. They're, they were Jesus' works, what he did on the cross. Um, him raising from the dead, he's, being, he's seated on the throne. It is by grace we are saved. We did nothing, absolutely nothing to earn our salvation. Absolutely nothing. And so I love how Pastor Anthony Wood states that. Like we, 
He saved us for good works, for his glory, not because of our good works. You are incapable of doing anything good outside of Christ. Anything that like non-believers do, like we see non-believers doing good things. They have, you know, they are charitable. They they have their own like quote unquote mission, uh, ministries. They help the poor. You know, there are, there are like even LGBT communities who help and do good things. But that stuff is counterfeit. Any kind of good thing outside of Christ is only an image pointing back to the fact that they are made in God's image, but they are not doing something actually righteous because we are incapable of that without being in Christ, without the Holy Spirit. It is just, it's a counterfeit. It's not real. And so I love this verse. There's so much to unpack in just verse eight through 10. So again, it's by grace we've been saved. This is not anything you did. It's a gift from God so that you can't boast. Like if we're going to boast in anything, it needs to be Christ. Christ, 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 Christ. If you're like being sanctified and you're being made more and more holy, which episode 10 is going to be all about sanctification and holiness and walking in a holy manner as a woman of God, that's all because of Christ. You've done nothing. You deserve nothing like we've got to keep remembering like we are wretched within ourselves. Like we're children, like by nature, we're children of wrath. We deserve his wrath. You know, this is scriptural. This is biblical. And so everything good, even the breath that we're breathing in is not, you know, not owed to us. Everything goes back to Christ. So, you know, it's, so if we're going to boast, we boast only in Christ. So for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So if you go to Romans 9, it talks about that lump of clay and how, you know, some of out of the same lump, some are made for God's glory and for grace and some are not. And this is a great passage to read about, um, you know, predestination, election, all these things that maybe you're questioning or maybe you just need more encouragement in. Uh, get into Romans. It'll rock your world. (laughs) And um, Dr. James White has great stuff on YouTube about Romans 9. Um, If you are questioning um, whether or not, if you've been taught that that's just like stuff for Israel and it it has nothing to do with salvation, that's wrong. And he does a great job of going to the original text and explaining why, no, this, these are, you know, um, salvation verses and they're very important for theology and for doctrine. So, um, but anyways, out of the sum, so that lump of clay, like, yes, our good works are all to give him glory. Again, all of our boasting is in God. So let's now flip over to Ephesians 1, which is one of my favorite passages. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved and it goes on and on and on. Um, this, this shows us that even before God created the world, before the foundations of the world were even created, God had, you know, in his sovereignty, this plan and he chose his sheep. He chose us. And again, this is not to pat you on the back and say, Oh, you did it. You must have done something for him to choose you. It doesn't, it doesn't create pride. It should create humility. Like, because again, you don't deserve him. We, we, I don't deserve him. My sin, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. First John says, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. (laughs) And the truth is not in you. We have all sinned. And that means we all deserve his holy, just wrath. That is what we deserve. That is what we are owed. And yet he has saved us. His perfect Holy Son, who is one with God, is God. The God man came and took our punishment fully, holy, 
There is no wrath left for you or for me. And so we were created for a purpose. That purpose is to ultimately glorify God. We have verses like in Colossians and 1 Corinthians about everything we do, do it for the glory of God, whatever you do. But we're also created for these good works. So what are these good works? Are these good works, you know, being a boss babe, being a CEO, being a follower of your dreams? No, (laughs) I don't think so. And so we're going to, let's, let's keep going into it. The other quote that I wanted to read to you guys, it's from, I couldn't find the author. It just said that it was a, it was the high calling, um, online. It was an article from them. I have no idea who they are. I just saw the, the quote and I really liked it. And it says the good works of verse 10, the one we just read earlier in Ephesians 2, says the good works of verse 10 are not the obvious religious activities scattered throughout an otherwise secular life. He means like going to church, you know, tithing, like these things that like, you know, a lot of believers feel like, well, I, you know, I go to church on Sunday. I'm a good Christian. There's no such thing as a good Christian, by the way, you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. (laughs) Um, He says, so it's not the relig- the obvious religious activities scattered throughout an otherwise secular life. Rather, the good works encompasses the whole of the Christian. All that we do by God's grace for God's purposes. I love that. It is it is so dead on. Okay, so let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4 which is a great passage, especially if you are a woman who is dealing with sexual immorality, um, that sin that's crouching at your door, or maybe you are drowning in it. Get into 1 Thessalonians 4. God gives us the warnings about brothers and sisters, so believers, who are engaging in sexual immorality or even leading others astray within sensuality and sexuality and it is very serious and he lays down the the law i mean this is these are i mean all sin is serious but not all sin has the same consequences and sexual immorality is the one sin in the bible that we're told to like run away from everything else it's like stand up against it right sexual immorality like joseph with potiphar's wife he ran He ran from her. We need to run, flee from it. It is not something to take on. We need to get away from it as fast as possible. Have no kind of lingering tempters in your life. Don't even flirt with this sin. Get it out of your life. So anyways, 1 Thessalonians 4 has an amazing verse um, that I want you guys to read. Okay, so... Let's just start in the beginning. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you are, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Here we go. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he goes into that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. There we go. This is a huge, huge passage to intake. So, so many times, you know, people are like, well, I don't know what the will of God is. Well, the will of God ultimately is to glorify him for you to be sanctified. Okay. So again, this is for women who are already saved. These are women who are already justified. And now what is your purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God and grow in more and more holiness. We are to imitate Christ. Now, I put a graphic on my Facebook page. I'll also put it on my website just so it's it's more accessible for people who may not be on Facebook. I did my best like with Canva 
which is a like a photo where I do all my graphics basically um trying to give like an imagery of like this umbrella and like so like the umbrella is like God has saved us like so you've been justified again not through yourself it's by grace that we've been saved you know Christ crucified it's all like because of what he did and then you're you become sanctified so after you are saved and only when you're saved can you start becoming more and more like Christ and that's his will for us ultimately that's the purpose and we're going to we're going to dig more into that into specific things as wives as mothers so but anyways so this umbrella right so you're saved now you're saved for good works. So what are those good works? Well, it's to bear good fruit. We're going to go into Galatians and read about the fruit of the Spirit. It's to make sure that you are continually repenting. And again, that is only done because of Christ's um, perfect uh, work in you. And what he starts, he finishes. Um it's to be a doer of the word, which is James 1. He says, don't just be a hearer of the word. And then, you know, forget what you hear. You need to obey it. So how do we become more and more like him? Matthew 5, 48 says we need to be, we need to be perfect as he is. Peter says we need to be holy as he is. These are commands. So how do we do these things? By continually growing with Christ, by being in the word, by being sanctified through the spirit, by being women of prayer, by continually repenting, you know, turning away from our old life the life of the world, of sin, you know, denying our flesh, fighting this spiritual war against Satan, and turning to the good things, the righteous things, the things that we're supposed to put on. We have a high calling as women, and I'm talking specifically to women. So on this umbrella, you you have these things that then we do, right? Because we're saved by grace, now our calling is for these good works. These good works that we have been prepared to do are not, I go to church or I tithe or, you know, I helped my neighbor or, you know, I, I lead a women's Bible study. No, it's, it's, it's your sanctification. It's the light that you are, I wanted to say beaming for Christ, but that's that wasn't really a proper sentence. It's it's the growth. It's the fruit that you are producing to point to him, to glorify him. It's obeying the great commission that you are to share the gospel. A lot of that is based on your life. But yes, the gospel is definitely something you need to use words. <laughs> the gospel is not just you living a Christian life. Like the gospel is actually something you need to share. It is a specific message to share, but these are the things we were created for. These are the good works, ladies. So it's not, I'm sorry, your talents, your job, even these extra little ministry things that you may be doing, which I will, I will talk more deeply into in a minute. These things are not what you were called to do. They can give God glory. They do give God glory. The only reason that we're creative is because we are made in the image of the creator. My daughter, my youngest daughter, yeah, I just started at a music academy and she has like we've been told over and over by her she's a singing teacher and um, now she has this piano teacher that she has like a gift for music and which is amazing because I do not <laughs> there's not many people in our family who do my husband can sing but like we're not a musical family but my daughter Presley has an ear for music she is so talented you can play her something like on the phone or on TV or whatever, and she can go to the piano and start to figure out how to play it. I mean, it's amazing. But I know that that talent in her is not to, and we you know we've talked about this because in her 11-year-old self, she's like, oh, I'm so talented. It's like, babe, yes, you are. But that talent is to glorify God. It is the fact that you are made in his image and all that we do that we're, you know, like you're going to you know music academy and you have singing lessons, these things are to glorify and honor him and then, you know, to be used by him for his glory. So maybe she will sing in church someday. Maybe she will, I, I don't know, whatever, you know, I don't know what he's going to do with it, but it's to, but is her purpose in this life to sing, be a singer and to play the piano? No, it's not. Because if, if something were to go down right now, and let's say, let's like push ourselves back into World War II. 
and they were rounding up instead of the Jews, let it be the Christians. Can Presley, my daughter, state, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't um, be arrested for my faith because um, I have a talent. I have a talent of piano and singing and I, you know, that, that is what my purpose is. So no, I, I have to, I have to say, no, a true Christian will say, I will risk everything for Christ. I don't know if that was a good analogy. <laughs> uh, I think I'm like Corey Tin Boom. Let's talk about real life people then. Elizabeth Elliot. Let's talk about her husband, Jim Elliot, or the other missionaries. Like these people had talents. They had gifts. They had dreams. You don't think that Jim Elliot wanted to see his daughter, Valerie, grow up to become a woman of God? He was newly married to this new little baby. We don't think that he, in his flesh, wanted to continue to be with his family? Of course. They had gifts. They had talents. But the ultimate purpose of their life was to be a living sacrifice, which is another part of these good works. Everything about our life is now about God. It's not about us. And so even if you are the most talented individual on the planet, dear sister in Christ, if it came to it, you are called to lay down your life. You're not, you're not called to say, no, I have a talent. I'm talented. God's called me to, to pursue this dream. I'm supposed to be a Christian speaker. Sorry, I haven't done that yet, but that's what I'm called to do. No, we are called to be living sacrifices. We are called to be holy. We are called to be imitators of God. And specifically to women, we are to be wives, mothers. And yes, not every woman is going to have a baby. Not every woman is going to be married. If you are a woman who has been called or lived out a life of singleness, you're not, these things don't, it's not that they, uh, yes, they specifically, you know, obviously you don't have a husband, so like submit to your husband doesn't make sense, but you are still called to do good works. You are still called to be an imitator of Christ. You are still called to be a living sacrifice. So let's talk about, so I'm going to like just, just not to leave you out, but I want to talk to the women who are married or have, you know, a desire and a prayer to be married in the future and who want children, who have children. So Genesis says that, you know, it's not good for a man to be alone. So the singleness women, it's not that some women, you know, it's not, women are, we, not, we may not like it, but in 1 Corinthians 11, it clearly states that man was not created for woman, but woman was created for man. And even if you're a single woman, you are still under the authority of some man, your father, the elders in your church. So we need to, you know, get off our high horse, stop being feministic and submit to the word of God. This is good. It is protection for us. It is a good thing. And the world and even progressive Christians, they will poison this. They will try so hard to make you feel inferior, to feel less than. But we know, we know in Galatians 3, it says there is no male or female when it comes to salvation. Salvation is open up to both male and female. It's no one is greater in the kingdom when it comes to the sexes. But we are created for specific roles. And ladies, it started in the garden. Adam had a job. Adam walked with God. And yet it still was not good. God knew that he needed something, someone to help. That's what we, helper, help me, help mate, whatever you want to call it. Enter woman. And this should be something that we are thankful for, that we have gratitude in, thanksgiving. It should create us, create great joy in us, not resentment. That's your flesh. That is sinful and wicked. Every time that you have that kind of buffing up in you that you want to be rebellious and be like, I am woman, hear me roar. Shut that down. 
with God's word and prayer because that is not the spirit of Christ. It's not. What God finds lovely in a woman is a gentle and quiet spirit. A Christian woman knows that her role is holy and it is good. And she is grateful for it. And if you don't feel that yet, your feelings are not your navigator. Christ is. Shut those feelings down. I don't care if you have to do it every single day, every single hour. Be rid of it. Stop listening to women who who teach that. Start listening to women who teach the, the biblical stuff. Whatever is feeding that in you, be rid of it. We have a high calling to be these helpers to these men of God who have been called to be the leaders, the providers. We're their helpers. I feel like sometimes I feel like women just don't even know how much quote unquote power they have because like there's those verses like you're either a crown to your husband's head or you are rot in his bones. And as a former woman who was rot in my husband's bones, I know how deeply my husband was affected by my, by my sinfulness by the way, I talked to him so disrespectfully, the way I was such a like uh, leading, you know, I wanted to be the leader. I told him he was stupid. I told him he was wrong. You know, I, you can break a man down or you can help him, help him in his sanctification with the Lord, encourage him. I mean, man, we have such, such an ability to be a helper or to be harmful to our husband. And the Proverbs 30 on women, it said clearly, it says clearly she does him no harm. We have a great calling in this. So let's, let's again go to that umbrella. So, you know, you have the umbrella and God's at the top. It's everything's for his glory. He's the one who saved us by his grace. And then after you've been saved, you're being sanctified. You're being, you know, you were made for these good works. And because you're saved, you're able to do these good works. So we're producing good fruit, which is love, patience, self-control. That's all in Galatians 5. You can read what the fruit of the spirit is. And it's not individual fruit. It is all fruit. You're growing in this fruit. Okay. And we're to be living sacrifices, as Romans says, like our whole lives, our whole beings belongs to God. It's all about God. We are willing to leave everything for God. We are not storing up earthly treasures. We're storing up heavenly treasures. We're about the gospel. We want to share the gospel. And then we have this high calling specific to us as women to become wives and mothers. Wives. We're called to submit. This is also your purpose. This is part of your good works. To be a submissive wife. Colossians 3, 8, 10. Submit as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. So sometimes when Jacob's annoying me, I don't want to submit. <laughs> I want to be moody or sassy or whatever. This is a great passage to go back to because it's like, no, I'm not serving or submitting to Jacob ultimately. I'm submitting to Christ ultimately. That's the picture. As Jesus is head of the church, so is a husband head of his wife. And girls, oh, the husbands have it, to me, they have it so much, so much more responsibility than we do. So please, don't ever be like, oh, I'm a victim, I'm a wife, and I have to submit. Like, are you kidding me? They're the leaders. They're accountable. They are accountable. There's, I mean, there is so much on their plate. We should have great, great, great desire to help our husband lead. Biblically, we should be his greatest prayer warrior. And I will talk more about all this in the wife podcast coming up. We're to be growing not with physical beauty, but as women who have a gentle and quiet spirit, because that's the kind of beauty that is worthy and and of value to God. 
He wouldn't say it if it didn't matter. He knew we needed to hear it because we can be so vain and we can be so wrapped up in ourselves. And again, there will be a beauty podcast coming up in the following weeks. I will talk a lot about that then. I'm just trying to break down what our purpose is. And then fearing God. Our purpose is to fear God because when we fear him, we obey him. We want to to show our love for him by our obedience. And the Bible says, if you don't obey him, you don't love him. So again, our purpose is to become more and more like Christ. And your purpose, sister, is to be a wife, a mother. If you're single, you're you're not, you're still a homemaker. I don't, even if you're in college and you're listening right now and you have a little dorm space, you're a homemaker of that space. Keep it clean. Honor God with the work you do in that space. Bless others by having a tidy room. You know, God is a God of order, not of chaos. And I think that there's a lot we can talk about that. You know, don't be lazy. You're a little homemaker. And it's it's glorifying to God. And whatever, so dear single women, like you're not, you are still called to all these good works. Your role is, may be different. You may not be a wife, you may not be a mother, but you are still to serve. You are still to lead others to Christ. You are still to open up your home and be a homemaker and have hospitality. These things are not just for wives and mothers. And wives, if you are dealing with infertility, if you are dealing, well, I think for anybody, I think that fostering and adoption is stuff that Christians should be doing. I don't think it's something we need to pray about. I think it's like we need to be taking care of the orphans. There are so many children who need godly influences. And I believe we should be opening up our homes. You know, do it safely, do it wisely. But I believe it is always God honoring to do that. And so there are options. Um, It's not the same thing by any means. um, But we're dealing with second infertility. I've been able to give birth twice, but I've had three miscarriages and we've been trying since 2017 very actively to have another baby and we just can't get pregnant. And there's, it's really the hand of God because there's nothing medically. I mean, even if there was something medically wrong, that would still be under God's sovereignty. But I'm just saying like there, there's no like thing on paper we can write down to say, this is why they're, they're dealing with second infertility. So I, I understand the heartbreak not in the same way, because I do have children, of every month realizing I'm not pregnant, you know, but I've grown so much through this pain and my desire to foster and adopt has only grown more strongly. We, we've got to be helping these children and we've got to be helping these mothers who are, sorry, I'm going to go on a tangent here. Um, these mothers who are struggling and they need to be reunified with their babies. Like ladies, this should be the church, right? Like this should be something that we're actively helping and praying over and doing, not leaving it up to these secular organizations to put their hands in. And then they give these mothers the options. "Eh, Why don't you abort that baby? Instead of helping them walk through a crisis pregnancy and then helping them after they give birth, We need to help these moms. We need to be there for these babies. Anyways, um, we have this high calling. So one of the reasons I knew that this was an important episode and I felt like, yeah, this is going to step on toes is because you do have women, and I've been one of them, who neglect that high calling of wife and mother and homemaker to pursue these things that they feel like they really believe it is their mission to be a writer, to be a podcaster, to be an influencer, to be a coach, to be a speaker, to be, you know, a follower of their dreams, to be a CEO, to be a boss, babe, whatever it is. And yet they are comfortable, you know, leaving the home a mess or leaving the kids in daycare or leaving the kids to kind of raise themselves. And that is not, not God's plan for the family. And I was one of them. And I cannot, I'm so thankful. This is a mercy. 
that my children do not remember how bad it was. They were so young when I was doing all this stuff online. This is during one of my most sinful seasons of my life. And, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful they don't remember that. But I did. I thought, no, I'm supposed to be doing this. Like, I've never felt more myself. I would say the most, like, unbiblical statements, right? Like, I loved myself. I felt like myself. I felt understood. I felt like I belonged. Self, 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 self. I'm sure Satan just loved it all. Loved it all. My, my flesh was all over it. Loved it. And I was neglecting my marriage, my children, and the most important, like, the overall that, growing in the Lord. I mean, at that time, I don't even believe I was saved, but that is, that's not the point of this podcast. There are women who are doing these things, even little ministries that are taking away from the home. Like it makes no sense. And I say this not to attack you, but to like hopefully encourage you or sharpen you. It makes no sense to be pouring into a church, into a ministry when you are neglecting your first ministry, which is to your husband and then your children and your home. These things come first. This is your purpose. Discipleship starts at home. The Great Commission starts at home. You're raising up little disciples. One of my favorite things to kind of go back to is when Paul was, I think it's fascinating. When Paul's talking to Timothy, the passage is in 1 Timothy 5. He's talking to uh, him about what to do with the widows. And for the young widows, he says, you know, they're becoming busybodies, like they're, they're becoming, they're dealing with sin, right? Because they, they no longer have a husband, they no longer have a home, they're not having kids. So he doesn't say, give them hobbies to do, or find out what their dreams are, and let's help them accomplish their dreams. Let's get them an active ministry. Let's find them a job to do in the church. Nope. He says, Encourage them to get married, to have kids, and to be busy in their own homes. Boom. (laughs) Boom, baby. (laughs) That's the answer. And I think it's so telling. It's not like we need to help them be better versions of themselves. We need to find them a job. We need to find them a hobby. What is their biggest dream that they want to accomplish? What are their talents? No, it was get them married, get them having babies, and get them busy in their home. This was like the answer to them to stop being busybodies and going house to house and causing problems that they were doing. This was the answer, and it's good, and it's because this is God's design. This is God's way, and it is so good, and I, I, my heart breaks for women who don't see that. They so badly want to hold on to these talents or gifts or dreams that they've been given that are good too. They are. They glorify God, but not at the expense of time with your family, with your husband, and taking care of your home. It's like when we go to Titus 2, which I will never be tired tired of Titus 2, and I really pray, ladies, that if you feel annoyed about Titus 2 that you really pray against that because that is not God in you. This is God's very word. It's his word. And if it offends you, good. (laughs) Because you're not the one who's right. He is. This is righteous. And this was not just for them, for their culture and their time. That is a deception. That's like Satan whispering to Eve. Did God really say Women need to be busy at home. Yes. Yes, he did. And I'm going to read it to you. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, work, at home, which then correlates right back to that Timothy verse, get them in the home, kind and submissive to their own, excuse me, their own husbands 
that the word of God may not be reviled. Woo! And then, listen to this. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness here we go. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Yes, 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 yes. That is right after he talks about women, be holy. Older women, be teaching the younger women. So whether you're a young woman or an old woman, you have a job in this Timothy 2 passage. You either should be learning and gleaning and being discipled by older women, or you should be the one teaching. Even single women, ladies, you are, eight, I mean, I feel like so much, it's like the domestic skills belong only to the housewife. No, it belongs to the woman. You have skills and talents that you can then teach younger women. If you know how to sew, if you know how to cook, teach younger women. You're not, you're not, you, you can't teach how to be submissive to a husband, but I'm just saying you're not. It's not like you have this lesser role as a woman. You don't. You are, you are created in Christ Jesus for good works. And that good work, those good works are ultimately being sanctified, growing in holiness, imitating the Lord, walking as he walked, repenting of sin, being doers of the word, word sharing the gospel, that fruit of the spirit, and being a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 says. This life is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about our talents or our dreams or our hobbies or anything. Those things are fine. They are not sinful, but they are if you are neglecting time in the word of God, if you are neglecting things that you should be doing that are that have been commanded of you as a believer and then specifically as a woman of God. Again, it makes no sense to be pouring into ministries when you are neglecting your home. And it may be scary to say, I have to step away from whatever you're doing but you've got to trust God. It is never the wrong decision to obey him. Never. We trust him with our obedience and we leave the outcome to him. Because ladies, this life is not about having this glamorous, healthy, wealthy life. It's not. Get yeah, Joel Olstein, all these guys, they are they are not true teachers and preachers of the word of God. They are teachers and preachers of self. It's a false gospel. We should be prepared to joyfully leave everything for Christ. We should never be clinging to anything, not, our, not even our husbands, not even good things. If you are a famous violinist and, and some, you know, someone, some extremist like cuts off your hand because you are a believer, praise God for being persecuted for Christ. That then is your purpose. Our purpose is to be living examples To be like Christ, whatever it means, whatever it costs. 
It could cost you your job. It could cost you your hobby. It could cost you everything. And, and in Christ and only in Christ can we find joy in that. That we, that we would be counted as, you know, martyrs. But, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, I just sneezed. <laughs> that we would be blessed enough to be tortured for Christ. I mean, that is, it's hard to even fathom, especially when we live in America and we don't face that kind of persecution. But there are so many stories we can read of, you know, real life Christians who have been horribly, horribly disfigured and beaten and flogged and put in prison and their families killed or raped or, you know, they've lost everything because they're, because they follow Christ. And their attitude is thanksgiving and joy because they trust the Lord and his sovereignty. And they know that this is not our true home. This is not our true life. We're looking towards heaven. We want to be with Christ. And so right now, while we're on this, this side of heaven, we were purposed for good works to glorify him, not to glorify self. That is our purpose. And we will dig so much more into being a wife and being a mother and those things in those episodes. I really do pray that if there is something that you're holding on to and you know that you're neglecting time with Christ, I mean, it is ridiculous that we can sit and watch hours of TV and movies, but we only give a minute to the Lord. I have felt more convicted in the last year about this than I mean, ever. I mean, I, I, I have gotten to the point where I hate the TV. We've like put it behind our, we have like, you know, whatever the TV sits on that piece of furniture, we've actually put it behind there and like decorated the top of that furniture because, and if we decide to watch a movie, you can pull it up, but I didn't want it to be the center of our home anymore. Like we're moving more towards screen free living, which is awesome. Um, And it's actually been really beneficial for our family. It's not always easy because it can become such a habit to sit in front of the TV. But I'm also going to have an episode on entertainment. We're going to talk about this heavily. Um, But ladies, our purpose is Christ. And because he saved us, we are now purposed to do these these you know, great works for him. And by great works, it doesn't mean you have to go be a missionary and, and convert hundreds and thousands. You could be the mother who is raising her kids to know and love God. And that is a high calling. And again, it's not about us. Every diaper you change, let's do it for the glory of God. Every dish you wash for the glory of God. All of it for him. That's our purpose. That's our calling. We need to stop living like women of the world who are very focused on, you know, their selves. Looking the best, feeling the best, having the best. Having others want to be them or desire them. That is not the way of a Christian woman. Everything should be about Christ. We should be wanting every part of our life to point to him. And we can only do that again by the Holy Spirit working in us. I love you, ladies. And um, yeah, I do. I, I, I just, I hope you're encouraged. Remember the Jeremiah 17, 8 verse, which I talked about last week about you know, our foundation is in Christ. And so even when the scorching heat comes like a tree whose roots are deeply planted or winds come or, you know, whatever, the worst weather comes, it does not fear and it never, never fails to produce fruit. So no matter what you're going through, no matter the circumstances, God in his goodness and grace will continually mature us in him. Let's find joy in thanksgiving in everything that we go through. All for his glory. I love you, ladies, and I'll see you next week for a new episode. Take care.